Welcome everyone. This class is Film Criticism 405. That means it's taught for undergraduates, particularly in their senior year pattern, or graduates taking an undergraduate course, which I'm teaching for both because we have those earning credits in graduate and undergraduate school from Harvard, CalArts, and USC, and it's almost interesting what kind of conversations you can get in with their Coursera logic and how to apply credit toward the degree you're working on if you're going through that through Coursera, which is a remote school, which is why YouTube Masterclass has given us the right to do this because it has established us as a class and that we're doing it as an academic class is for them exciting and is exciting for us and that we leapt on board as soon as we saw their needed help at Harvard for film professing and we leapt on board of all these different societies and game changers and everything that went along the way but mostly my team has kept us serious about the art of teaching and the need for teachers and professors and what the whole name of the game of even getting your PhD really is is becoming a professor and that it's strange for me because when I was remote getting my PhD a lot of requirements that were being missed were the ones that I'm gaining now, although I've already been passed through, but that I have to gain these requirements as a teacher. I knew overall that I was lucky that Masterclass was able to open that door for me, and now I'm able to assist you all in learning about film criticism. And we ask what film criticism is, because from an outsider or from someone just coming to a new place talking about film, and they're saying criticism is writing about film, critically speaking, critically thinking, critically examining. One more, one mode of criticism is you kind of uh, analyze, the, analyze the scenes of the story. And if you analyze the scenes of the story, then you'll really know the psychology behind the story or some methods are, well, if you adhere to the mythology of the story, then the story will take you through it just like the mythology will. We can argue critically speaking, but we know that typically writing about a film or a book in literary criticism, which I've done a lot of, it's really good. And you can write about music. Writing about the arts is basically what aesthetic criticism is that we call it criticism is because when we're writing about art it takes critical thinking skills to obtain a standard high enough to relinquish onto your friends and family how much you love the arts and if you can do that you're already following one of William James rules as living normal psychology is to boast out every once in a while that a work of art is your favorite as though and I've spent enough time in this introduction and other intros have been shortened and made. Just have me passing by with hello, welcome to Masterclass and all this stuff. And I take only the claims I have to Masterclass from YouTube who had getting, got me ready for the job and is actually inquiring me to take it earlier. Still wants me to do how to make YouTube videos. And I'll give a little prominatory point on that. If you actually get an account with YouTube, then you can make the videos and agree with them or not if they're going to accept what you've done as a video. Now, I'm not going to give you any secrets in terms of getting music or getting represented or getting put out on the rep represented list or whatever, because some of us get there and that's really hard. But the main thing is to know you're appreciated just for getting your videos that you want others to see. I mean, typically, when you're putting a YouTube video on YouTube, you want others to see it. And it doesn't have to be this masterclass thing that I'm doing, even though this is pretty low professionalism. It's pretty low key. We've just got our surroundings and me. And it's so ominous when I wave my hands and say, this is an amazing film, you know. But when it comes down to it, we're fulfilling a need in the art project symposium as a whole by covering class where there hasn't been class before, and I'm not just saying that for the Star Trek joke, but come on. Like, if we can all spread out a hand and lend to the classes that need to be taught in certain schools and prove that's why they need to be taught, then there's nothing really up against us remotely teaching these classes now, especially in the time when all these colleges are rebuilding and searching for strength and want leadership and 
but they'd worked it out with me and that it was a, I was a long time in the coming stretching through certain periods of my career where I had to take certain recognition for the films I had made and the articles I had written had to be under publishers, you know, actual clearance of a publisher and things like that. So it's not like my collegiate life has left me totally jaded in terms of what a film really is. Like I'll only watch Caravaggio now. That's our joke from the days of the critic of the Illuminata movie by, uh, and in the cast, you see, uh, uh, the actors and they're talking about their favorite kind of, and the critic comes in and he's all this, it's Christopher Walken is the critic and it's John Turturro's movie. And he says the reason he only bets on one show is because his only show that he even likes is Caravaggio. Now you look at the Derek Jarman film Caravaggio and we're only going to spend a minute there because Derek Jarman's got some issues with his punk ability that get a little overstreamed, but Derek Jarman does the same thing and it's cantankerous canon. Well, we're not really going to look at that. I would say that one thing that Derek Jarman reminded me of was uh, the director of The Man Who Fell to Earth, Nicholas Rogue, because it's kind of like this movie that you never really see him fall to earth, but you kind of get this feeling he just got to earth because of the way the camera movement is and everything, and it's David Bowie. And it's that David Bowie theory that wherever David Bowie goes, exciting, crazy, wild, imaginative things happen all around him anyway, but then you just have to recreate it for the movie. So you just look at all the exciting fantasy labyrinth-like world around David Bowie when he walks around and hums to himself and you know goes to the ATM or whatever he's doing. But like, the, here's the thing. We're talking about sci-fi films in a genre. We've just spent seven minutes setting up master class going, wow, is this class going to teach us anything? And now we're learning about genres. Well, genres and introspect we have talked about before are the actual carrier modules of the myth convention and iconography of the actual movie. That there are some movies that are under an auteur style that's true, like John Ford, but that he also directs in the Western genre is somehow linked to his auteur style that can be seen in his films that are non-Western too that typically a director sticks with his genre as much as possible because it shows his own critical awareness and his own growth in that genre's dignity. And that's why John Ford did so many Westerns and Alfred Hitchcock did so many suspense thrillers and their auteur genre are all tied together in that sense. Most of the sci-fi films we're looking at were not only sci-fi directors, but that these directors are the grand sci-fi directors are kind of surprising because they kind of came out of nowhere. I mean, you have all these, you know, these Asimovs and these big scoring magicians of the sci of sci-fi era. And then, you know, you find out that like, well, L. Ron Hubbard wrote scripts in the thirties for Hollywood, but they were mostly like for the early nor, like not even before, even before nor was existent There's like small town, small underground kind of gangster films on the hot street, kind of jazz age musicals of the 30s were L. Ron Hubbard. I mean, if we would have seen one of those projected into one of his sci five films later, I think we could all loved it. And I'm not here to say that Battlefield Earth isn't a respectable film, although it does have some technique that seems a little primitive compared to most sci-fi films of its time that, like, it does, in fact, have the whole cantankerous Earth can't be destroyed message. Is kind of what I like about it, because even though Earth's almost limited to shambles even more than Book of Eli, for instance... The battlefield Earth, the Earth still lives. There's still like three guys alive, and there was, you know, they're gonna revive the. Now here's here's the first movie I really wanted to talk about, other than in Metropolis and A Trip to the Moon, which we know that every sci-fi film is Metropolis fused with A Trip to the Moon, just like every western, is the Great Train and Robbery mixed with Birth of a Nation. Now I'm telling you that A Trip to the Moon is on this Forbidden Planet at the beginning, Forbidden Planet, not to be confused with, uh fantastic planet this is forbidden planet the one with leslie nielsen and it's a really good that i can never remember and i'm going to mention to you oh it says directed by fred mcleod wilcox that's a really under known director and i think we should all pause and think wilcox that's an interesting name because i don't remember him from other movies that i brought attention to 
by anyone in Masterclass or anyone in film history that it seems like kind of a designated genre pick B movie when it comes out, but it's so astounding on this widescreen projection they just invented that the colors look more amazing and the film technique is so beautiful and vibrant when it's played back that only the restoration on one of these Blue Reser DVDs makes for Forbidden Planet to be the movie that you really want to move towards and see where all sci-fi comes from, that, that all the 2001 ideas come from this, that the Metropolis idea is there in The Tempest in Shakespeare by a droves, that the female connection with the outsider other in the midst of an alien realm is kind of exteriorized, in Anne Francis, Walter, Walter Pigeon kind of becomes this megalomaniac, wants to take over the planet, probably the only person on the planet, and that there's an inviso beast that gets lasered down with the guns later at the ship is all brilliant, but that the robot looks like the Lost in Space robot is something that we'll have to quantify only with the fact that this movie was in the 50s and Lost in Space was in the 60s, and they probably modeled it after the same kind of robot, and it is a genuine interest that these robots have similar robots, and I've heard from a TV aficionado that there is an episode of Lost in Face that has the robot from Forbidden Planet on that episode, whether they name it that or not. It's the same robot, Robbie the Robot, makes an appearance on Lost in Space. So there you go. There's a bigger world than TV and cinema than we even know about where you can draw upon the mythology of these characters from outside and bring them into the new plan of how to make a sci-fi movie that this is 50s b sci-fi has everything from flying saucers going around the universe i mean it's got like these dames on these planets who are walking with tigers and they're no fear of me the robot's trying to make gold for the humans that are asking him to make gold and he's just trying to come up with it on the spot the thing is, is Forbidden Planet digs into the Shakespearean Tempest mode so much that there's an underplay of how these people that work in the realms below affect it so that they can, the three of them can have the pleasure garden up top that American scientists land on this as kind of an apocalypse now moment because now they're like, do we take them all with us? Do we take them all out, leave them with the aliens? Do we leave this planet alone? Well, we got to kill the beast that our ship attracted first, and then we'll figure it out. That they don't figure anything out is part and partial to the fact that it was all just a quiz show for new technology in the realm of how they could make it, and that they were really screening the widescreen of this film at the time. It makes me feel pretty comfortable that I wish I knew more about this Wilcox director who had must have had tons of like these hammer and ideas like before their time and like these surreal visions of like this world unhinged and like these metropolis hyperbole shots of like just long rows of computers and furnaces and things like that and i think the iconography really is the last of the b classic sci-fi that really defines the whole genre as what it is even today like this big widescreen trip to them outer space to find what's going on that star trek even owes itself in ways to a movie like this and other movies from the b period is because they're always on these adventures across outer space that leave them into these like human interest stories even if the humans are aliens all right so we're voting post-classical sci-fi rather than saying or we are saying the day the earth stood still the original is like where we start with the classic sci-fi Although we all know classic sci-fi really started with War of the Worlds, where Orson Welles read the War of the Worlds a campaign from the book by H.G. Wells and scared everyone into thinking that it was a real broadcast about real aliens landing. Is really where the sci-fi genre began. King Kong is another big element for where the sci-fi genre in American history began, and I think that's why it's unfair fair to always bring it, but you should anyways to bring out Metropolis is because this is the sci-fi film of all Metropolis that Forbidden Planet's based on that Metropolis takes it from there and shows the robots being used to be humans and that like no one's real sure about whether they're going to be safe and that like their safety off is certain things about it and that the, the, the romance is so Hollywood bleary. Makes me actually kind of say the next one's an irony because of how distilled and played down all these things we've just learned about the hyperbole of Forbidden Planet and even Metropolis, which is extrapolated of expressionism, where you have zigzaggy 
shots and that classical Hollywood's always been a little bit expressionistic and that now in these B movies it's more expressionistic than say even film noir which has only one light these lights are so ecstatic that at night you can use day for night and, and at day you just go on the set and program what time of day you want it to be on the set that they're building even in these B movies they have these large sets that they're able to use it's one thing I'd like to mention about Roger Corman too who would later be making these kind of movies that are like the B-sides but still just as important as the A-sides and in many ways, some of them were better than the A1s anyway. And that they had these machines and these studios and people working for them for real is one of the tributes that they have. And that there are really people even in studios like I work for, like Troma, for instance. You can see that there are real influential film people that do care about cinema that work for these companies and that try to make these sci-fi genres so they can be entertaining for all. And that they learn it from films like this is important. I think that the expressionistic angle to the sci-fi always comes out in the kind of space traveling. The Westerns are like traveling from one area to another on the plains and in outer space. We have an American genre now of space travel that America is trying to be the best at space travel, that 2001 A Space Odyssey comes out with way better space travel than they had now, maybe even than they have that now. That pretty much than how they had then that my cousin who's in the army said they had to steal a lot of military secrets for this movie doesn't even make it any less controversial that Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke put it together themselves out of a script and that they both were using quantum physics is interesting because I mean if you're taking 2001 as quant quantum physics then what we know about, that explains completely what the monolith is that the monolith is an indicator of where the selection is between the between the uh, intermissions, the uh, eternal, the eternal cycle, the infinite. If every infinite is trapped between a digit and a digit, like in quantum physics, when you have zero to one, for instance, you can't get all the way to zero that you can get as infinitely close to zero as you can before hitting zero is still a hard number to quantify. And that's where quantum comes from. But that each status bar of the monolith is basically to say, we're selecting a digit here. It's good. By the end of the next, by the time the next monolith comes along, an infinite of time in its own way will have gone by. And if we just have to divide the time, not just by editing of the film, but like, editing ourselves in our head where we started keeping track of what time track we're on and that like it does do that intolerance thing where it switches way ahead thousands of years and then doesn't go back to the K the Neanderthal days which I thought was impressive considering Planet of the Apes is trying this whole overshow of the exaggerated genre and here's 2001 this movie that's been coming out for like 10 years 2001 ever since Spartacus they've been all saying oh Stanley Kubrick's gonna lead us to the outer space movie you know and Stanley Kubrick's probably seeing Forbidden Planet going this is gonna be a hard one to get into but that he goes into it quantum physics and that we see each time we divide up a number between one monolith and another monolith it comes down to another number we can divide between that and the next or whether anything's selected, that we don't really come across the vast infinite until we've reached digit to digit or monolith to monolith being quantum physics, then we're actually counting how many chapters or conflict resolution points we're going to need that are eventually at the end really um, counter countercultural thrown asunder as closure at all and there isn't really closure in 2001 A Space Odyssey. I don't understand. I mean, I know the music's hopeful, but I don't understand how Carrie D'Elia coming off of the ride from Jupiter, which I've described as like an orgasm from God, like the Last Supper or something, that traveling through the space travel of the pure cinema, the cinema poor, the way we travel through space in 2001 to Jupiter in the ultimate dimension. It's beautiful. But for him getting trapped in a little room that kind of looks like one of those Matrix rooms, even though it's way before the Matrix. And we're going to talk about the Matrix, but he gets trapped in this little room. Now, if he's looking around, he's knocking over his wine glass and everything. That's one thing, but that we kind of get their sense. And we've heard Kubrick kind of bantering about how there's aliens in control and that he's going to die and become this kind of like 
newborn zygote of an alien in space. And that doesn't really reassure to me anything. I don't know enough about molecular physics and outer space babies to know whether or not that outer space baby is going to go back to Earth and claim it or become a new Earth itself by just evolving into an Earth and would it be a living Earth and is that where our Earth came from in reverse? I don't think so because we're taking quantum now and not going backward in time, although Jupiter and beyond infinite makes you think there might be something that did go backward and maybe could have. Because if it's beyond the infinite, one of the only ways to be beyond the infinite is to go backward infinitely. And the only way to go backward infinitely is to try and find your original point, which you can see by quantum physics. You can divide those numbers as many times as you want. And then if you can divide a number as many times as you want, period, you know that the, the, the infinite goes on forever because that means you can never get to the ultimate amount of numbers you could have divided it for because theoretically that's infinite because so far we're reaching in quantum physics by Immanuel Kant and other teachers nowadays that that is the trek to absolute zero is easily an infinite between zero and 0.1 away. And then we would even put a monolith on zero is a bad idea because we don't want to put too many things on the intersections either except signposts because we don't want to weigh it down with having some kind of elective quality of zero not existing because zero just doesn't exist. But the smallest number next to it is really hard to calculate with human skill that if we have an intersection then and another intersection like we do with the monoliths that appear four times, I want to say, then we know that that's where the infinite caught up to and is ready for its next stage of the infinite. And the only way we know that is through the shell of quantum physics having to do with 2001. Now, one thing that I love about this movie, too, is that there are spaceships that dance in outer space and that they dance to the music, makes it so the computer of the camera can calculate how to get the distance of the ships and then moving around to look like an opera in space and that's cool i don't really have any objections against that except for the artificial intelligence used in the computer later was all looked at as something that would evolve into this like megalomaniac computer which hal does and that notice the lowest special effect on the film is showing the computer terminal which is just mundane and kind of lame not like one of today's computer terminals like that would be really exciting and have all this amazing things in the window and you would just look at it and it would just like in zero the zero effect or whatever by uh terry gilliam the zero theorem where you see those screens and they're like bright and bubbly and full of ideas and information and then you watch master class and you're like why is he in such drab dialogue with these beautiful exciting movies well let's get beautiful and exciting we, we already took a ledge on american sci-fi by saying that it's somehow past those movies of the flash gordon era of the silent era of the early silent era of the mixed bag of short films versus short films versus serial films flash gordon is where it all started that by the time you have forbidden planet the flash gordon era has not only run itself the day the earth stood still is coming and we've already had War of the Worlds by Orson Welles. So a lot of these things have taken place in sci-fi. And, the, and the Forbidden Planet, one last thing we've got to realize is that's the one that George Lucas saw in high school and really wanted to get into the sci-fi genre before too so that we can see again how the B media of one era, era, era comes the A media of the era and later. That Blade Runner is a good film to discuss quickly and we do have some more films to get through so we want to stay pretty steady about this but Ridley Scott's a director I don't teach much about and he sometimes gets frowned upon because I think his his uh he's like the Marcus Aurelius like he's made movies about right but he's the Marcus Aurelius of directors because it's like when he meditates he can see exactly how he's going to set up a shot and go into battle and how he's going to do the winning battle and he's got all those blueprints and he studied his blueprints and that is an engineer and an architect and not just a craftsman, but an artist himself, because Ridley Scott puts it all into it. He's kind of like an Anne Rand of artist. He puts the biggest elements you can of the biggest 
obstacle you can lay before man in, in terms of its biggest sector. And James Cameron does that a lot too, but Ridley Scott has such a thing with seismographs that even his movie Legend is a curiosity into how we could make the devil look even crazier and more demonic. And that Ridley Scott has been doing these these uh, futuristic fantasy films as well as nights and round table fantasy films like The Duelists is all leading up to the brainiac science f fiction epic that's thrown us all a certain wave of characteristic and that is is Blade Runner and I bring that to you because to know what a Blade Runner is you have to be into the film enough to know that it's like this robot that's sent to kill someone or actually it's Blade Runner is a robot that's sent to kill robots and that he doesn't have to be a robot, but he has to be his icon that is made just to kill robots. And that he has to assassinate robots that are typically assassins. Doesn't mean he's a Blade Runner assassinating a Blade Runner, because a Blade Runner is specifically for killing the assassination of the potential assassin. And that's where it gets really confusing because some of the robots he's terminating have just been suggested for termination. Not that there's a moral ethical value about it, that they don't go on killing long after they're made to, but just go on to kind of respect life. Doesn't challenge the fact that he's set on a timer Harrison Ford to kill these robots at a specific time with a specific way and they have to go and that they fight back. It's no big problem for Ridley Scott to make that look cool. But that he makes the whole city look like the turnpike to L.A. after you get off in Hollywood and your helicopter and across it in every shot. That your helicopter and across this futuristic L.A. isn't too maniacal compared to what it looks like the L.A. news every night. And like it looks like the streets of L.A. And that this is kind of a, one of those, like, like 2001 was a nationalistic allegory because it was showing that our technology is so good that our technology might evolve and get better than us within the quanta that we live and I had to use that word. And then this one is definitely about the nuclear family and the Oedipal construct about loving the mother and putting down the father, that Walter Prince is the father and and Francis is kind of the daughter, but she's the mother too. And that he lays claim on her as an earthquake and there's all this drama to do about the mythology of this. Puts it in as a, Rebel Without a Cause way of genreizing the abstract world of the nuclear family and how conservative that era must have been when all they were doing was thinking they were going to get nuked by Russia the whole time, and that was around the Cold War anyway. That we come up all the way to Blade Runner, and now we're on an international basis where we deal with everything on an international way, except now the film is so ahead of the future that it's ahead of the future now. Unless there are robots, you know, of running around out in society, which they have reported that drones have run around out in society and that there are weird ones from foreign countries makes me wonder if they've had a kind of robot drone looking guy wandering around, you know, but I don't know. Man. I, I really don't know enough about the sci-fi genre to know whether or not any of this stuff has existed. I do know H.G. Wells was like a prophet, though, because 20,000 leagues under the sea was about a submarine and submarines weren't built for 50 more years so i can see how some of the the technology and mythology in these sci-fi films which blade runners and other metropolis like forbidden planet i mean the whole city is this dystopia of the underworking peasant slave keeping up for the overpaid everyone else and that he's stuck in the mystery like the woman on metropolis was after she was made in cloned into a robot and everything that he doesn't know in this one whether he is a robot but he dreams of electric sheep maybe someone dreams of it and that's the philip k dick story this is based on is it do androids dream of electric sheep and uh, there's some beautiful rutger Hauer dialogue in this where he captures poetic grasp of what it's like to be a robot out of time and out of sequence and not knowing what to do with yourself now that you've completed the one task you had to complete. I mean, you know, the whole thing is the way it's kept in like super human mist looking futuristic science is beautiful. It's like got that whole like, uh, re you know, return of the Jedi. But at the same time, like the next one I'm going to bring up is Dune. And I've gone into Dune a lot in other classes. So I'm only going to mention that Dune 
has a lot of different versions, as does Blade Runner, but the one thing that's consistent more in Blade Runner is that the Ridley Scott different versions were actually meant to be given out by as though they were Ridley Scott's actual different versions. But his different versions compelled more of the home video audience because he was saying he was going to release every version of Blade Runner, including two others that he released himself, that he wanted every version to be out, and he wanted it to be thought about, that the film had different versions, and that Ridley Scott did that not to make more off the money, but to satisfy everyone with the diversion they wanted to have, which was why he made separate versions, because he was getting criticism as to how to end it. In the most of the scene versions like this one, it ends so ambiguously that whether there was expected closure, we've forgotten by then, if there was expected closure, or if... Harrison Ford's just supposed to go and eat at the Chinese food restaurant again and meet aliens in the street. I'm not sure what quite happened. It was kind of a Hiroshima and more ending. They kind of just clipped out the last few reels of films they had and wondered if the existential Blade Runner will go on his days finding anything else for him to do now that he's mastered his goal. Now... Dune will outspectacleize just about any movie in existence, and I think that one thing that's interesting is the movies versions that came out, or even like the Spartacus versions, they were the movies that David Lynch wasn't sure that he made, wasn't sure that he was there for, wasn't sure that he was doing everything on the film, had to take his name off of some of them. This one, strangely enough, says directed by David Lynch, so we're going to go with the fact that Dune is directed by David Lynch. Okay, let's give it that much credit. That it was directed during the time of Return of the Jedi is just a magnificent fantasy taking place with both of those films being in deserts with giant worms swirling around. This is already getting good. But now that there's other Dune movies taking place and coming up and being Dune in so many ways that, like, this is kind of overbearing, but that the most overbearing of all is the one I'm holding in my hands only because of not just being heavy-handed in its own way, but sci-fi in an otherworldly Star Wars kind of way that takes the sci-fi off the Earth and the Earthlings like 2001 and these others and puts everything in alien land, that everything is on a, in a galaxy far, far away, that the whole idea of Star Wars isn't like they're fighting for Battlefield Earth. It's like they're fighting for Battlefield Planet, not Earth. It's like some Earth, Earthen enclave or a few of these human-like people that you can kind of recognize as... as though they speak English as though that's the language they would have spoken, but we just take that for granted because of the sci-fi genre. Now, the myth of the sci-fi genre is people versus technology or people with technology or how technology determines humanism. The technology determines humanism is a good way to define the mythology of sci-fi. The conventions of which are spaceships, aliens, laser guns, you know, uh, we have enemy ships, we have giant ships, big ships, all flying out in outer space, shooting at each other out in outer space in these Battlestar Galactica dilemmas that we're coming up with, that computers can fabricate these beautiful star battle shots, and that suddenly we're getting these worlds that exist outside of the Earth that actually are more like Star Wars, and that's what that brought to light. By the time Dune's coming out, it's saying, well, like Frank Herbert said, these guys were all aliens too, that they might have had some connection with Earth is never really resolved in Star Wars. I don't think it ever is in Dune either. That In Star Wars 1 through 9, Rogue One mentioned, never mentioned Earth as a planet, but that in Star Trek, Earth was the planet that they were from is something that's interesting about sci-fi, whether or not it's about our time on Earth way in the future or some just other galaxy somewhere that had all this take place. And that Dune is one of the ones where the, it all takes place outside the galaxies. And you know, Mick Jagger's not in it, but everybody else says that's supposed to be it. That Sting is in this, okay? You gotta have a rock star in a, in a film like this from the 80s, from David Lynch, who's not sure if he directed it or not, coming off of it. I mean, he must have really thought, well, at least it was cool he got Sting involved. Because when they got Sting involved, they got real, real quality. And that, like, it looks like the Stargate cover and that it came out way before Stargate is a question if Stargate didn't just go into the same universe as Dune was interceived 
in one of its worlds. But I have to mention, there's a lot of aliens in this that have subtitles under lines. And I never understand aliens with subtitles under lines, because wouldn't they be first subtitling it into the language that the aliens spoke? Or no, I guess they would have to subtitle it into English. But if they all spoke English, then I suppose the French version of this has the alien speaking in the French version written out, which makes me wonder if the aliens change language with their own alien language to make for a different ang language of world-used languages like English or French. or Because I don't remember any aliens ever really speaking, you know, like Japanese. and then But I've noticed some characteristics of some characters in Star Wars that seem Japanese, but weren't piecing together their version of the language with the Japanese language. And so none of these tales are really mythologically splintered or given back to a hope that there's a locust tale that can straighten it all out in our own world. Not everything about Dune and Star Wars are allegorical, except that they're saying that we can win the war if we have the best machines and we run the best machines because we're the best people and we have the best goals and intentions for keeping the 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 galaxy firm and secure all throughout that there is an allegory you could see then to the militaristic instinct of the 80s and 90s to be the stand-up patriot guard of all things human race to go on whether you have to tell a few aliens what to do or not and that if sting avails you at the end sometimes you got to fight him but we're switching it up because we're getting a little closer to the time we're at now and the time we're at then. And I like talking about Dune. I know one thing you got to know about Dune is the spice. I mean, it's all, every planet has a little bit of the spice and that they go and mine spice because about a thousand pounds of it can last for like five minutes of energy. You know, it's more than that, but it's hard to find it, hard to mine it, hard to keep it going, contain it. Hard to use it as electricity, but it's the only thing in the galaxy that lights everything up is the spice and that they go everywhere fighting creatures for extra spice and is just what they got to do in terms to keep the interplanetary structure of everything going on as it should. All these thunders of lightning and these thunders of like laser gun battles just look so beautiful with their color and their explosions and their spaceships blowing into things and you get that a lot of star star wars now this is a movie i'm gonna need some help with on the comments section or somebody to help me out because this is a movie that's a sci-fi genre but it's also an action adventure film and i think that the last few we've shown were all completely sci-fied out that this one is actually one of lucas's picks for sci-fi is kind of interesting but that the matrix is more than meets the eye is one thing i'm gonna to have to give it to the matrix for now that i'm in in my older age you know that i've studied zen transcendism transcendentalism i would say that what they're doing in the matrix is more like zen transcendentalism that it is in fact a good idea to be ascetic and you know like to be unruled by your utility that the chi should be non-existent because you should have nothing ruling you that's material now that they have to wear clothes and they have to wear guns and that they have to eat soup as a little anarchist preachy of me about those kind of battleground situations but that they're in a computer that's in a computer that all got sunk into this weird digital monster that created everything in it and then fused you with it means that now there's other things going on with the whole program that knows all about you. It knows how to find you. It knows where your your voice pattern so much that it can find you instantly. Basically, the Matrix is the Internet can find you instantly. And that you can instantly push a button to go back into Matrix Land is wild. And that they cut, like straight cutting into Matrix Land is a bravo to sci-fi films. Everybody else would have had the magic Stargate portal. These guys are just like snapping their fingers and they're in the next scene, which is wherever they Matrixed into because that's where they're going. And Lawrence Fishburne knows how to get through and in and out of the Matrix that they're all governing through not just to take order in the matrix but also so that they can have this time component to gathering as many as they can 
to, for, to stop the destruction of their matrix because it's the only possibility of world that they have. Now, if I've explained it at all, I haven't because that's just like the pretext to why he's running and jumping and making it across these giant chasms in the sky to other buildings and that he's all gets all his programming from a computer. Like, I'd love that. Like, all you have to do is bring down a computer and put it on your head, and then suddenly, next thing you know, you know all the information of the computer. That's great. That's what they do in the Matrix to learn Kung Fu. I'm like, now the guy, Yun Win Po, the guy that teaches... The guy that teaches... Hang on! The guy that teaches uh, Kung Fu to all these different actors, and then now he's teaching them to the Matrix guys, and they're one of the first guys since, like, Iron Monkey to use the, the clip. And so now they're all hanging on by ropes and they're all being filmed in subsequent cameras that like the LA Times showed how they do that with subsequent cameras to make it look like every flash frame is part of the moving suspension of disbelief and everything. That we take the Matrix and we see this, this gun, this whole thing is getting more and more climactic as it goes. It's like first he's like wondering, is he being followed around? Then he's like, there are two people following me around good and evil. Then he's like, I'm getting in with the good, but the evil are going to attack me. Then he's like, I wonder what the evil people want. And then the good are going to be after me. And so he finally gets in with the good, goes down the rabbit hole, gets everything sorted out and lives in this world of like cyborgia, which just looks like the aftermath of the robot Holocaust from the Animatrix, if you want to know what I mean. And if you want the whole story, get Animatrix, get Matrix Reloaded, and get Matrix Revolutions. And I think Matrix Revolutions says it all at the end when Keanu Reeves is basically the final sacrificial martyr to the computer zone, which he was going to have to be in Matrix 1, they already said, to be martyred for the cause of taking down the generator of AI. That would have let the computer robot monster man, Smith, who's in all of them, supersede everything and grow into clones and then they would take over and the matrix as we know it would collapse just like what was happening in number one number two has some other stuff of like other things you can do with the matrix like change channels on it and still be in the same one is priceless because there's all kinds of things that we're learning from metaphysics and one thing about eastern metaphysics is that they certainly fit the matrixes let's be these uh bamboo artists let's be these uh eastern mystics let's be these ascetic guys let's do what's good for the right of good of the universe and that we only know to stop the menacing force that is eating the matrix with the matrix was eaten long ago is shown in the animatrix and if you watch all four of them i really think they work out as one of the great sci-fi series ever that there's not a lot of space travel in these is kind of one of the reasons you know it's limited to action adventure but that there is enough transference from our reality to theirs and that their reality is full of aliens and sci-fi mythologies conventions and techniques and the technique in this and all of the rest is that the visual metaphor of technological determinism that sci-fi is technological determinism that's why so many movies nowadays are sci-fi because the computer determines how the movie is made and i think the computer can make things movies about itself and about computers and about other technologies in ways that drive the movie into technology like if they brought rocket packs into spy kids too that's technology that they've brought into the movie to technicalize it and technologicalize it and the technology driving the actual story is really what you're getting in a sci-fi gear because if you think war of the worlds all the aliens have better weapons than us now they're coming after us now they're the greater technology challenging the lesser technologized to a battle and the lesser technologized are being pushed over and leaned aside by the technological dominating ones that in the matrix to become technological dominating you have to become a zen buddhist it's probably because they then had to learn martial arts and then they had to blow up a building and we can't really tell you what happens in the rest of them although we can tell you what happened to the directors of the matrix they later made a film that i'm bringing to you right here towards the end of everything that is the sci-fi class of master class of youtube and then i've missed everything from what happens at the end of forbidden planet and the final lines of even et but i won't 
miss Spielberg, so we're going to get Spielberg on. But next, we got to learn about the Wachowski sisters who did Jupiter Ascending. Now, I'm just saying they're sisters in a way that means that they go by that because they had a gender operation and they both changed to women. I'm not making that up. They're really cool guys. I would really give them high fives if I could. They're really great guys, the Wachowski brothers, and they know to run a clean ship, and they've always been into these images of pushing the edge, and uh, they've done other movies, but I like Jupiter Ascending, not just because it has Milos Kunis, who I think is the most beautiful actress in Hollywood right now, and then Channing Tatum, the most good-looking guy in Hollywood right now, and that they're in this kind of underbelly of the Bronx, and that they're kind of in these dead-end jobs, like as like this you think it's going to go on like in a Kevin Smith universe, but a Kevin Smith universe does kind of take place in this because suddenly she's realizing that she's the queen. And Kunas goes from toilet cleaning to finding out she's the queen of some planet, probably Jupiter, and that the ceremony for being there is, to, is in a few days and it's going to take a long time to get clearance through Jupiter. Now, this clearance through Jupiter plot is something new for the Wachowskis because usually in the Matrix, if anything came like a tree in the way of the plot, it would just stiltly turn into the fact that you could melt the environment to make it look like any way you wanted to, and that was the part of the technology. In this, it's like the environments of dune-like locations, let me say, later in the film, actually are coming important to the Earth dimension, that this is in the Earth dimension, and that Matrix is in Earth dimension, means that really the ones we found that were outer space only and though they all are fiction because they're taking the extremities of science to the next level of either fear, power, or agenda. And I never really trust the agenda sci-fi ones because most of them have an allegory anyway. And Jupiter Ascending has the allegory of the working slave class peasant of America dreaming big and then becoming the freaking queen of Jupiter. That can still happen. That has happened so many times in the Walt Disney era of like this Cinderella story of someone that just got treated horribly their whole life or had to do all the work that nobody wanted to do. And then suddenly they're, they're even being scandalized in outer space. The space battles are going on. You should have never come here and reclaimed your throne because now the whole space balance is thrown out of sequence. And whether you should, but you fight for your position as leader of the galaxy when you find out there is convincing evidence that you are, and you go on with it, you lead your galaxy, you pick up the pieces and move on. And I think that's what's cool about Jupiter Ascending, is then at the same token they have these kind of, these uh, fall back on characters that are like, they're, they're like, they have their superheroes, and then these characters underneath the superhero that are like their secret identity. And I think secret identities are one of the things that makes these movies of sci-fi interesting is because we're all thinking on a Blade Runner level or if even if even you can with Forbidden Planet and all the rest the secret identity level is really really made home even more so than Hitchcock by Jupiter Ascending that they can go back to cleaning toilets before they go back to rooting the universe really shows yet another Marcus Aurelius uh, prestige that you can be good to people when you rule people even though you haven't always had it the easiest to get to the place you're at now because that won't just keep you humble that'll keep you realizing that it could all be sent away the minute it gets here and that's an existential relief of jupiter ascending that does kind of buy us some slack on a happy ending that usually these sci-fi movies end on computer kind of one but everything's broken level Computer kind of wins, but everything's broken. That's how most sci-fi movies end. Computer kind of wins, but everything's broken. And now you're taken to Jupiter Ascending, where we're like, I don't know whether the computer not's broken, but we can go back to Jupiter anytime we want, you know what I mean? We got our registration and getting your registration, which there's a little bit of chuckle, chuckle, some things about getting immigration in this, you know, that make it look hard to get immigration. And let's face it, customs is probably not even as bad as the customs on the Jupiter level of Jupiter Ascending and that you have to get a badge to go there means I'm probably not going to get to go there because in my portfolio, like, it's true. I used to have my passport, but I don't have my passport now. I definitely don't have my intergalactic passport. I wouldn't really want to 
clean toilets for a living, but I would want to definitely celebrate Milos Kunis for taking a role like that, even knowing she gets to be queen, that she has to take such a humble role. I don't, I can't think of many actresses that would do that. It would just take a role that seems so low to your career only because you know that in the midst of it, the Wachowskis are going to venerate you as this like heroic character that takes on the world and leads us all to freedom in outer space and a dune kind of rebellious warfare kind of way. And now what I've reserved the last few minutes of my class to talk about, because we are edging a time that we've discussed it all again. And I'm getting ready to teach five more of these seems like uh, seven, eight. Yeah, we have to teach five more of these classes before this semester is over. And so we're going to catch it in multiple parts and edge it all in and bring you every, every master class that's been proceeding from these Harvard CalArts USC talks that are professorship of me at those schools being solidified by the staff and everyone else I needed to talk to, especially at USC and CalArts. I know their staff had no problem at all leaning these courses towards Coursera and then attaching a Harvard to it makes us all really proud that what we're going to do conceivably is have enough of these classes to where Harvard can really say, well, we have enough now courses or enough courses benefited to the program that we can actually claim we've started the program. So we're trying. We're working on some small but getting bigger ideas. That that this is the one I wanted to get to most. Speaking of smaller, bigger ideas, this is Steven Spielberg. Now, I've talked a lot about Steven Spielberg being the overlord at USC, and that's true because George Lucas and Steven Spielberg are the overlords of everything in my world because I went to University of Southern California. And, oh, my gosh, that's where I teach now. And still, if the overlords wanted anything changed or anything different or anything said about them different or anything went wrong, or anybody said anything bad about him, or anything went wrong, and somebody was echoing something they were doing and not and taking credit for their credit. I mean, there's all kinds of things that can go wrong in the filmmaking world, that these filmmakers have come so far ahead, and predict predictably, they don't run into a lot of these thresholds because they've already dealt with it so many times that it's been stamped down as something that just can't happen. So if there can't be a penny that appears outside of my car first thing in the morning, it's not going to happen. It's being stricken by someone that's working on the movie set. But no matter how eccentric these guys are, they're big movie makers. I mean, that Steven Spielberg's been blowing it up since Jaws, since uh, Color, uh, Jaws and, and Duel and Sugarland Express. That he was already risking it all with Sugarland Express and Duel about a truck going off a cliff because a car can beat it and we're all cheering. Great. Then, you know, we use the same sound effect in Jurassic Park as a truck going over the edge was supposed to be what a T-Rex sounded like at that time. And now you get to Jaws. And then you get all the way, from, and then once you're at Jaws, you're pretty much at every movie's a hit. You might have to sacrifice some children's stuff, but we're not going to deal with children's stuff here because I don't really know how to completely go into the mind of a child. But if I did, I'd want to see Steven Spielberg and Tim Burton movies all the time. If I was just a kid, and I'm not saying that they're only for kids because they do some really grown-up messages and Saving Private Ryan and Dark Shadows and everything, but if you want to know what it's like to be in the mind of a child, it's Steven Spielberg, and I'm not insulting him. Some people would say, well, he's too much for kids, he's too much for kids, and I'm like, so Ready Player, for, Ready Player One? Yeah, it's for teenagers that like point of view video games that you feel like you're the character in the role playing game playing the part and that everything's filmed from the point of view of the character that the guy is in his avatar of course and that they're going to make an airbender reference I don't even know but that he keeps moving forward in this world of like he's gaining level ups and that he's playing each level the way it needs to play and that it has everything from a shining level which really took Explain the Shining level. The Shining's a cool movie. If there was a video game that wanted to have a Shining level, let it be like Resident Evil. Let them have a Shining level, you know? And it's also Spielberg going, oh, I love love making Kubrick a video game. This is great. If I make Kubrick a video game, I'll rock over Kubrick big time, you know? And he's thinking of all these things, ways to rock over Kubrick. That's, that's my kind of filmmaker. How do we rock over Kubrick? Oh, if we just put it in a different fancy, it'll be so rocking over Kubrick. You know, it's great. That kind of compatible... Uh, 
that kind of availability of a personality in a film that wants to compete with every other director but wants to do it in a conceivable technology like sci-fi is moving the movie that we know the computer has done most of the movie making in this is not to what we don't know of how much a reality was shot with the multi-reality ways of shooting it to put over the skin of the otherwise animated complete background. One of the things that's interesting about Ready Player One is like Once Upon a Hot Time in Hollywood and Star Wars Episode Nine. they were like the last three movies that were really big that were released and were as big as they were and were taking in this whole climax of films coming to an end now that there was things like the uh, COVID virus, the pandemic, the quarantine, all that, that were taking it all away. And Ready Player One and Episode Nine and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood kind of had this way of being like hopeful for the future of cinema, like we have broken onto the last level where games are now movies or, or like we'll make a game out of Hollywood with Once Upon a Time and Hollywood make a game out of it. And it's like these game movies that don't even know they are that by the time you get to episode nine, you feel like you're controlling even the ship because you're like falling over on one canvas of the ship and then falling over on the next canvas of the ship. And it's like what you're looking around and seeing is what the camera's looking around and seeing and that it's not even the wrong kind of AI. Now, the wrong kind of AI is when it's we're trying to write a story or directing a movie or editing. Now, the right kind of AI is when they're using animation and calculating quanto with animation is one. Um, CGI, that is the computer-generated imagery. They can use special effects, cartoons. And, of course, three, video games. So you can use AI even, even in some case for creating game engines, you, game engines. To get the quanto, you have to use the AI modulator. I mean, sometimes the AI is just a calculator and really you shouldn't worry about it then because it's just got the algorithm that gets you to the final logarithmic calculation. That shouldn't be too bad. But if you're finding out the calculation of what you should write creatively, that should be stopped. There should put away AI, not allow you in, uncon in an unconventional way to have to use the same word over and over by a machine is so degrading and so against everything we've learned in school that I don't want to use words the computer's going to tell me what to use just intentionally from it, man. I'm going to write something. I've written, you know, I may not be the best writer ever. I, I'll admit I've got some flaws as a writer, but I'm a better writer than AI. And I can write AI under the table. And it's things like 2001 that make me, oh, yeah? Well, I'm just going to take all your circuits out like they did in the movie, and then you'll be singing Daisy. Daisy, give me your answer, do. But think about it, in Ready Player One, he has to find the maker of the game who has been digitized into the game with AI, and he's still alive, and he finds him, and then the game stops, and everything comes to a hedge, and then he's beating the game, and then the computer's beaten, and everybody tries to pick up the pieces of living only an avatar life in this Ready Player One environment. But it goes to the world, now that it's all trashed out and limp, to build an utopia society where i guess they won't need video games because playing them again be kind of pointless because we already figured out the main reading, meaning of them all which was to beat them that we beat the hardest one and there is no more video games it's kind of a good message to tell your friends and family how to be afraid that there won't be movies coming out in a few years because of viruses and we're not talking video game viruses that would launch us into some shining hack that they kind of get into and then get out of and it's like some rat's maze and i'm not going to spoil the whole film for you although it is like silver surfer than a movie in a way and that king kong's in it and we talked about king kong starting sci-fi yeah well spielberg throws king kong and king kong in just for like kind of a side character just because like even one of his own cameo roles is king kong getting a cameo role barely so you got to watch out for spielberg's film references because He'll Godzilla, Godzilla you in half with a scene from Grill, Gremlins before he jaws you <coughs> for the third time. And I'm not going to say that I'm just I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say, well, 
you know, I like War Horse a lot. It's a great film, and then I won't defend one of his kids' films because War Horse, I thought, was an incredible film with an animal use. It's like Al Hadjar Balthazar, a really good animal use in a filmmaking that they're not, they're showing the horses neutral on the crime of war is very essential to that film. I think that it's a, like my cousin Jason says, like a Kurosawa type lament war horse. And I think that there's Spielberg movies like Jurassic Park 2 that you're not really enjoying except on an expected entertainment level that it's kind of taking you through the motions of part one's original discovery and trying to to mesmerize you as much as that well when spielberg does it he takes it down godzilla style just like he takes it down king kong style in the ready player one and you got to be move the best in the bad scenario because one thing that's cool about ready player one is they'll go into a and a and b environments now an a environment is top shelf when you're in like a halo game but a b environment's like a, a an exploitation b not really a lesser effect counted score but that the death race is below in a b genre and Easy Rider's kind of still in a B genre, but floating towards A, you know. And you get you get these movies that were originally going to be like a B movie, like Stagecoach, and then it came out as an A movie. It was an A-list. John Ford did an A movie, and the reason he did it is because he finally perfe perfected the sound of the Western. And that's why these sci-fi films after Metropolis and from Metropolis and from the interplanetary types we've got with Dune all the way to Ready Player One that has Earth again under chaos, but will it be defeated and destroyed and rebuilt and battlefield Earth is felt and all these, except maybe Dune, which feels it the most, because now we've got to go to other planets to find the spice to energize us, right? And then we're always flying to other planets to find something as technological determination. But we're resolving things with a robot teaching us is technological determination that the movie itself by being based on the components of how the computer can build the special effects is in and of itself technological determination that is examined by itself even in terminator as self-reflexive robots creating robots within a system of computer science that creates other computers out of the computers it's created and that they're like this evolution of created machines that are just Aaron? rising on the people. Can you give me five minutes? I'm just going to slide it under your door, okay? Okay. Happy Valentine's Day. Thank you. That was a Valentine I appreciably had to take from someone's dear friend of mine, but to, to get into the concept of these movies that are postmodern that are, you know, these cinema for the sake of cinema that sci-fi genre is all about the technological determinism that's filming itself as determinism like you say in scanners by david cronenberg you see the technology filming itself as though it's the technology destroying and creating imagery of the further destructive technology and that whether the technology is destructive or not it always has some kind of disposal of other technology method which is kind of an industrial hang on of the technological dimension that so moves the cinema. Then we get the Matrix and we get this scene where there's kind of this roundabout picture that floats all the way around the screen and all the way down is now a technology that we have and we're determining how to make the film and how to fit it into the film narrative. You know, while we're seeing the effect that we've been technologically determined to make this movie isn't necessarily a bad thing or less than creative. And it isn't AI because you're talking about a process that you're confronting as something that's emotionally attached to you, albeit it's in the future and may not exist, but that it brings you narrative boundaries of a frontier, of outer space, of things beyond the infinite, of things existent between two quadrants that are that is an infinite in between because it keeps dividing. That we can search for those people that are warming up our tempest below us that are keeping in this us in this world where we determine what's good or bad and we just make them do all the work. And there's only two of us now and we're floating around and now there's only one of us in a little room knocking over a wine glass, getting ready for bed, turning into Zarathustra. There's a lot of these options these sci-fi films can take and there's a lot of like Invasion of the Body Snatchers I didn't even get to in this. And it's like sci-fi horror or The Thing. 
sci-fi horror, I mean, that whole genre is in and of itself a roller coaster ride with a rampant hard landing. And if you can't always take fear, then fear mixed with sci-fi and like the alien genre, again, of Ridley Scott, who is making a different kind of movie than Blade Runner, which is also Ridley Scott. And that James Cameron would come in and kind of do all the same kind of movies as all those. It's not to say that he isn't an incredible director. The digital domain of James Cameron is one of the high-end production houses of anything special effects in Hollywood. And I've even got to work on some looking over measurements to see if they were accurate to the mathematics of the whole thing. And I am telling you, they are up to spec on the most accurate even in quanta, mathematicians in Hollywood, which you would think would make it less of a creative film that we're only following the creativity of the technology we're limited by, but that's not exactly it. It's that we're inviting these old technologies like samurai experience into Star Wars. Take a samurai and give him a lightsaber and you tell me that's not interesting in color while laser guns are shooting? These are instigations of pop culture that has set us time over time to entertain us with our own mythologies and things we ask for. And this time the thresholds are outer space itself, like with a black hole or a planet that's under tyranny or that we're out of energy or that there's not enough air on Mars, you know, like in Total Recall. But we all better listen to the ending of Total Recall where she, sure, where you see. Arnold Schwarzenegger, and he says, was it all just a dream, she says to him. Sharon Stone says to him, or the girl at the end, was it all a dream? And he says, well, I hope so, but you better kiss me before we wake up. Okay, he doesn't say it that way, but if he did, it would have been perfect, because what he's saying is, is that if he wakes up, that universe ceases to exist and instead of showing him waking up in the next scene which they could have done in hollywood cinema they juked it and went straight to the end of the movie so he's like they start making out because the idea that got the storyline going is now total recall told in form and now they're kissing because they're realizing that the world is an invention of their minds and so they kiss before they wake up. Dude, that, it makes perfect sense. And that's a Philip K. Dick. And that's why we bring it back in to the Blade Runner standard. And that Minority Report would have been a good one. Or AI for Spielberg. Because those are Philip K. Dick all over them. And the Minority Report actually is a Philip K. Dick. Isn't very surprising. Considering it's about searching for this crime that's going to happen from someone before they commit it so you can bust them ahead of time and keep them from doing it and if you don't think that's 1984 looking at thought crime with spielberg giving it just a little bit of the old spiker giving it nice and hard making it this hard concoction for people to swallow that the things that we're addictive to and everything are actually now the very modulations of our feeling the familial familial worth we did in the family era of the 1950s that we're constructing a utopia is only falling flat because the basis of communication has fallen to all these technologies whether they are determining to be interconnected or not and i think it's interesting that technology usually takes a low stand sometimes in spielberg because you see that et builds a phone to the outer space through actually really interesting toys and like, he uses toys from the toy shelf to call his home planet is really cool and at first i'm sitting here you're thinking i'm saying that's a bad idea but no i'm actually saying it's uncanny it's taking the things of our world and making them metaphysically connected to a world out there and that spielberg is taking ready player one and he's putting the same problem of the metropolis the tempest the underground soldiers that make everything happen and that's part of the game too and so now we've got the whole metropolis plot but where the metropolis plot even in star wars gets bagged by the c-3po having a similar looking robot as the the robot with the with the five-pointed star over the robot the satanic star was over the robot that robot was using for c-3po and stuff but ultimately I find that except maybe Star Wars, 
because Alita, Princess of Mars, is a Russian film. We're avoiding that one for now with the Russian instability and all. But, you know, when it comes to sci-fi outside of America, and I know this is going a little over long, but you've got Alphaville, you've got Solaris. We won't talk about Solaris. And you've got Metropolis. We talked about Metropolis. Alphaville, I'll end it like this. It's a film nor film where you were just supposed to take it that cars are spaceships, that it's in black and white, all the cars look like spaceships anyway. That the main guy looking for the action is not a pretty face, but is actually this guy that's been ruled as kind of drizzly as a human being, but is a comic book hero in some agendas, this Eddie Constantine hero from the film Nor Rejection Lanes of Hollywood into this kind of Alphaville environment where he is this sudden hero and he's this Dick Tracy type who's searching all over the city for clues as to why there it seems like there's a computer that's finding ways to kill a bunch of people and that it's, again, it's the 2001 we're up against the computer before 2001. And so you're getting these, like, mild, like, impulses of prophecy again, writing, like, is this where the computer becomes real and takes over? And you already think the computer's kind of taken over Alphaville anyway with its weird accent, its weird voice, and the computers even speak French could really scare a lot of people. So don't worry your f friends that aren't ready for the foreign film sci-fi because I'm taking you to a place where Naked Lunch is Canadian, and that means it could really shock a lot of people that aren't up on the Cronenberg Magneta, that uh, it can get pretty shocking in there, but all for either point of psychological nature of the value of why we play that in a film, or the technological boundary was accepted as to this far as where we place it in the film, gratuitous as that may be. And I think that there's nothing gratuitous about Sci-fi, it's like the alien in Dune. He's crazy, he's about to blow up. He looks like an alien head from Metroid or something. But oblivious to the rules of suspense, suspending your disbelief in a sci-fi movie, you pretty much expect to see big blobby look, looking aliens in a film or something. Or, And I'm not saying anything bad about the Wachowskis because when they brought Jupiter ascending to life, it was like Alphaville done with the... Hollywood budget and I finally felt good about being a hero in another dimension and nobody knowing that you're a hero in your own there's kind of something nice about that and I'm not saying I would know but at least we've got this class and we've had this fun and we were able to talk about some sci-fi movies and I hope that you really focus if you do on sci-fi on the technological determinism not just what they had to do to make the scene work but how to make the scene work based on what they had to do initially is what you should be saying about why they're determining a shot to go this way in a science, science fiction experiment. See you next time.